thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony Frischconnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony Frischconnect. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plant Problems. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today, I am going to share, we're going to bring back a former guest. We actually spoke to him. Uh, It's almost been a year now since we last talked. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss kind of, you know, what it's taken for him to get to where he's at now and the challenges that he's had to overcome. I've got uh, Matt Gillard from Jamco LLC with me today. Hey, Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Tony. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, uh, you know, I'm excited about this show because, for one, it, it, your story kind of takes me back to uh, many of the gentlemen that, that I knew that were starting in uh, the grow industry uh, way back a long time ago, uh, along with uh, myself in some of the early days back in 2005. You're, you're a bit you're a bit older than me in the, in the grow world. So I, I appreciate seeing that. I know there's some, there's some growers out there that would scoff at us because they've been growing for like 40 or 50 years. Right. And they're like, ah, these guys <laughs> don't know anything, you know? So uh, I, I want to uh, give a shout out to those old school guys that have had really started this back 40 and 50 years ago. And I think they've got some amazing genetics that they've passed on um, to their family and the kids that they've brought up. And so with that, Matt, let's, let's, let's start off by um, share with people a little bit about who you are right now, and then we'll go into a, a little bit more of your story. Okay. All right. So uh, my name's Matt Gillard. I live in Northeast Massachusetts in Amesbury, uh, born and raised in the town that I'm living in right now. Um, right now, we have 12,500 square feet of a canopy that we're hoping to start soon. We bought a Nexus uh, 420 hybrid greenhouse, and we're hoping to bring that on line in the Massachusetts market as soon as possible. Uh, we have uh, all state in local provisions say yes Uh, we're just waiting to get on the state's agenda right now and get our final vote um that's huge right now uh especially for most of the people that are trying to like how can i start this so this is where you're at now let's go back what almost 20 years yeah so it's kind of crazy uh to get where I am now, uh, I graduated high school in 2000. Uh, in high school, we were using cannabis a little bit, uh, paying really high prices for it and, and not getting a good product at all. Uh, we started experimenting around a little bit and trying to grow some stuff. Uh, early story is uh, junior or high school. My buddy's parents and my buddy's father left his staging up on the roof of his house and he didn't finish roofing the project. We thought that got the best sun in the world. So we decided to take that and climb out his window and we grew a dozen plants on top of the roof. Uh, that worked great. For what the first was this, was this in Massachusetts? This was in Massachusetts, 1997, 1998. How, uh, how, how scary were times back then of when you guys are like, well, we're going to grow a plant. Like what was going on in Massachusetts at the time? Uh, a lot of, a lot of people then, uh, it was decriminalized, uh, but you were still getting in trouble for it, still getting arrested for it. Uh, a lot of people were trying to grow in buckets up in trees. Uh, there was still the, the flyovers in, in not camp here, but uh, the feds were still doing, the DEA was raiding places and looking around. Uh, so my buddy had the staging on top of his roof. Uh, it was his father's staging and he figured it got the best sun in the world and his dad was too lazy he was never going to go back up there and finish the roof so uh we started a, a couple of plants in his closet and the next thing you know we had uh, six or eight plants out on the roof of his house in gallon buckets and they were doing pretty good they were 18 inches tall three feet tall and then as soon as they got tall enough that you could see them over the peak of the roof uh, my father my friend's father pulled home for the day and found them 
They <laughs> climbed up under the roof, uh, threw all the plants away, and, and kicked the shit out of us pretty good. So he um, knew exactly what they were like right when he saw them then. He, he, he said, what the hell are these plants doing on top of my roof? And, uh, yeah, went from there. So, uh, so then, you, yeah, yeah, so, so you've got, so you've got this idea. We want to grow some plants. Now, did you smoke much before then or no? Uh, probably starting a freshman year of high school. Okay. Uh, and we were just, we were more growing it because we didn't have access to it. Uh, and the access that we had was the, the Mexican cartel weed that was just a real low quality. Uh, and the allure of doing something that you were told not to do, it kind of set us off on that path. And we were at the times, uh, we were hippie kids. Uh, a lot of my friends were touring with fish and things like that. So we understood the scene a little bit for sure. Um, so so some of that card back then, when you're talking Mexican cannabis, what did it look like? We're taught with, with straight brick weed. Uh, and it was uh, almost, like a, I've seen stuff that looked almost like an alfalfa brickish looking with yeah. a bunch of, is that kind of what, how, what, how? It, it looked pretty much like a brick, a, a regular masonry brick that you could just break it off and break it off and break it off. And it, the more you broke it up, the, the more it became uh, fluffed up. It was amazing. In 99, I went down to Panama and I got some uh, Panamanian brickweed from down there. I think it was from Colombia. Uh, but that guy told me, don't get caught with this. You're going to go to jail. It's going to be real bad. And it was the size of a bullion cube. And it looked really like a soup bullion cube. And I started breaking this thing up, thinking that I wasn't going to get a joint out of it. And it broke up to, uh, there was 100 seeds in there, I would, uh, to my surprise. How did you even come across this gentleman? Uh, we were on a, a surf safari, uh, so we were at the surf camp, uh, so a bunch of surfers hanging out, and, and cannabis does run in the surf community pretty pretty deep, um, so that's where that happened there. Cool, so you just kind of met him through a few connections, and all of a sudden you're you're buying some Panamanian cannabis from <laughs> some guy down there, because you hear yeah, stories it, about it, but I've never actually run across it, so it's curi- I'm curious. It, it, it was straight. It looked like a bullion cube. And he took a, he took a big knife and cut a, a long sliver off of his big brick and then cut that into four bullion cube sizes and said, yeah, don't get caught with it. So you're graduating high school or you were still in yeah. high school at this time? Uh, th- th- that was just before I graduated. I graduated in 2000. Okay. And then in uh, 2000, I res- wasn't really looking for college. I didn't really know what to do. I-, I was good in the trades and good with my hands, good building. So I hopped in my car and I always heard about the Emerald Triangle or, or Humboldt County uh, from the old guys. They drove my From the old truck. guys that were the surfers or, uh, you know, people that you were just around um, in the in the scene yeah. or what? More, more the, the old surfers. Okay. Nor, North Carolina has a good surfing community. Humboldt has a good surfing community. So it was more my surfer buddies that have been out there and said, this is this is the place where all the ganj happens in the U.S. So I said, no, let's go out there. So hopped in my car, uh, drove out there, spent a year out there, got on a, a landscape tr- uh, crew, uh, planting and doing new landscapes. At that time, uh, there was one little grocery store in town. Yeah. What? Which... So were you in Mendocino County or where were you at exactly? I was in uh, Humboldt County and I was living in Trinidad. Okay. Trinidad had a, a population of like 315 people or something. Uh, in the one landscape company in t- town, I got onto their crew as a, a brick mason, knowing uh, East Coast brick stuff. They said, come work for us and do our brick patios. And things so like we're that. talking about a town that might have a gas station Maybe they've got a, you know, a liquor store and a small little, uh, yeah. you know, grocery store type thing, right? Yeah. In, my, in my boss at the time, I'm 20, 21. My boss at the time is 40, 45. Uh, and they're telling me these stories from the old days and how it used to be and up in the hills. And, and they used to have something they called Hillside Strangler because uh, they grew it on the hillside. And every time you smoke it, you'd cough so much it would strangle you. Okay, okay. Uh, 
he uh, we were cleaning out his shed one day and uh, I was up in the attic and I found a bale of two or three pounds. And I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is a huge amount. And I asked him for it. And he said, you don't want that stuff. It's trash. And that's my emergency uh, pile that's just going to sit there forever. Was he pissed off at all that he, you came across it or was he no, like? Not at all. Not at all. I, I was in charge of cleaning the shop that day. And the, the top shelf of the shop had his emergency duffel bag full. Okay, uh, so so you got to know him pretty yes. well, it sounds like. Yeah, and then my foreman at the time, uh, two weeks prior to me getting onto this crew, uh, he got raided by, uh, I don't know if it was the FBI or whoever. Uh, with some federal, co- with some, some, some federal, some government. Yeah, they, uh, he got a phone call when he was at work saying, don't come home. Uh, they took everything out of their house, all his plants, everything, and they left his bong sitting right on his coffee table. Uh, so he got home that afternoon to a, a note on the door, his house ransacked and just a, a bong sitting on his table. Uh, he was pretty beat down and pretty scared uh, in the whole year I was there. He was going through prosecution and things like that, uh, hoping not to get uh, sent to the big house. His story ended up working out pretty good where he just got uh, a bunch of probation and had to pay fines uh, and never saw any jail time. Um, he gave me, Gary gave me a little bit of guidance there. And I went down to the local hydroponic store, picked up a thousand watt light and started growing in my closet there. So he was um, going to, he was going to basically teach you kind of how to grow per se. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Okay. And then, and then two other people that were on the landscape crew, they were growers also And the style back then was a little bit different than the style that we're dealing with now. And it's closer to a style that we're trying to get into where the federal limit, I believe was 99 plants. If you had over a thousand, hundred plants, you went to federal jail. So these guys would grow 98 plants and they'd all grow them. So there would be 18 inches tall and be one colon. So they are growing these beautiful plants in one gallon pots that were just ounce nuggets, each of them. It's easy to harvest, good flavor. It was real blueberry flavor. So, so let me ask you this. So just so the people can visualize, because when you look at a plant, it's hard to imagine one solid cola. How do they create something like that? It was flipping it early. Uh, taking all the branches off and not uh, not splitting it at the top, not pinching it off so it branches out again, branches out again, branches out again. Um, so basically you have no branches going out to the left, to the right, around 360. It's kind of one solid branch exactly. that's heading up, right? And, and, it, and it kind of would look like your arm or your form, forearm okay. stick, sticking up out of the ground there. And you'd have a good nugget that would be hard to wrap your hand around in, in just one straight nice piece. Um Fast forward a bunch of years in Maine right now, uh, we're medically, uh, we're allowed 36 plants. So we're not going to grow personal, plants. personal use. You can do 36 plants. Yeah. In, in the medical industry, okay. in the okay. med- so even for medical, you're allowed to do 36 plants. No okay. more than that. Um, so those 36 plants in Maine are the, the biggest car size plants you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're trying to maximize every square inch of that plant. Right. Exactly, exactly. So they're not worried about nothing. They're worried about numbers in kind of a, a different way. So it depicts growing style. Now, uh, we're, we're not in the Massachusetts. Isn't, the, isn't that before. strange how regulations dictate how you're growing your plant? Like, because there's so many much better ways to grow it besides growing these massive ones. But all they do, all, all that the regulation has done is create these super massive plants now instead of um, you know, maybe a weight. Well, you can grow this much, you know, it, yeah. it's really interesting how that that's shaping uh, the way we grow. Cause it's always kind of been that way. And, and it's a little, it's tricky for me now having this greenhouse and I'm going to have 10,000 square feet of canopy and I'm not uh, held to plant numbers at all. So I'm in cahoots with my brother and he's growing his 36 up North. And now we're trying to completely change our growing style to grow a plant every square feet rather than a plant every eight square feet, 10 square feet. Yeah. It, it just, it sounds like uh, you're kind of learning how to be more efficient with what you have and really, really capitalize on that. I know that's, that's a, that's a hard part. That was a hard thing to learn as, um, as I went into the legal market, the same thing. It's like, okay, how, since I can grow this any way I want now, what's going to be the best way to do it? Cause everybody has their own style and what they think is going to grow the best quality. Right. 
Exactly. And it's growing in your environment, too, that uh, what grows best in a mixed light greenhouse in New England is going to grow different than Colorado and different than Northern California. You take a Northern California grower and you show them the humidity that we have here uh, and they can't handle it. It's, um, yeah, it's nothing that they've ever had to deal with before. Yeah. yeah. So then a uh, 2001, 2002, uh, I'm in NorCal. I realized that uh, I love the place. It's beautiful. It's a little too rainy for me and it's a little too tight for me. Uh, the locals wouldn't want to let me in. Uh, I made some good friends, made some good connections, but it was a, a real closed thing. And they always said, hey, you're the East Coast kid. You're the East Coast kid. So how long were you there for? Uh, just Three? under a year. Just under not, a year, okay. Yeah, not that long at all. I, I got a, a couple of crops off, and then I ended up selling everything and uh, moved up to Alaska uh, for the following summer. And interesting with Alaska is uh, I drove my 94 Ford Ranger uh, from Boston to California, then from California up to Alaska. I went over the border in Alaska, and we're, uh, well, going over the border uh, into British Columbia, uh, me and the, my partner at the time, uh, we're smoking all the weed we can, uh, trying to get everything out that we had stacked for the last year out of Humboldt, out of the vehicle. We're going to cross the border, and we think the border is 100 miles away. It ends up being 10 miles away. Uh, so we're throwing weed out the windows and stuff, all scared <laughs> as can be. <laughs> how, how, much, how, much, how much weed are we talking about? You guys are tossing out the window. It may be a quarter pound. Ended up okay, away. but still, that's, that's <laughs> different. <laughs> A good amount. So we get to the border, the uh, border agents, we were sticking stickers all over our vehicles from everywhere we stopped. And we stopped at some place and we got a, from Idaho, we got a, a malicious flag uh, that we didn't know it was the militia from Idaho. And we stuck that on the side of our vehicle. So as soon as the border guys saw that, they gave us a, a ration of shit. Um, finally got over the border. Everything's good. We're clean, having a good time. We get oh, to hold on, hold on just a second. I want to ask you, when you say ration of shit, are they tearing your car apart? Are they looking in your gas tank? I mean, what are they trying to they, do when they, uh, they're removing a lot of things from the car. We're out of the vehicle. Everything inside the cab is out. Uh, I didn't smoke cigarettes, but I used to smoke a lot of joints and uh, on the window, uh, on the rubber had some burn marks. Uh, so they're scratching at these cigarette burn marks that are joint burn marks. They're saying, Oh, what's this? What What's this? What's that? Yeah. Uh, and I had a knife on me and uh, that became a thing that they were, I didn't declare a knife, but I said it was just i uh, I'm going to Canada. It's a pocket knife. It's not. Are you guys standing next to them while you watch them just tear this thing apart? Is yeah, that it? exactly, exactly. So what's going through your mind when, when they're doing this, like, Oh man, I hope we got everything out of there. Or what? <laughs> Pretty much. You know, in a way, we didn't vacuum the car. So what's underneath the seat, what's going to go on. Uh, it was definitely nerve wracking. Uh, get up to the Canadian side uh, and they did pretty much the same thing again uh, and then sent us on our way. So we went up to Vancouver and spent a night in Vancouver. Uh, and at that time in downtown Vancouver, there was one or two coffee shops that you could smoke weed in. Uh, so we went downtown, found these coffee shops and you couldn't really buy it in the coffee shop, but they had a house bong and you could smoke there. So we went to the coffee shop and there's the, the local guy that's walking around that's selling it to you inside the coffee shop. So we rent a bong from there and have a smoke in a coffee shop in 2001, 2000. They, they were renting bongs at the time. They're like, you just pay them five, it, 10 bucks and you got a bong. It, exactly. Exactly. It was like a hookah bar. You paid for a place okay. to sit and then you could pay for the different hookahs you wanted to smoke out of. And then the kids walking around sketchy saying, uh, Hey, want to buy this? Want to buy that? So we get a little dime bag or something off them, smoke that. And I say to them, uh, I'm going up to Alaska. I need some weed for the summer. Where can I really go? And they go, uh, well, you know, uh, they go around the corner and knock on the steel door. So we go block down the street, go around the corner, found the steel door, buzz the buzzer. It buzzes back. We go upstairs and I have no idea where I'm going. I'm bringing my girlfriend at the time with me. Sketchy as can be. <laughs> we go up to the second floor and this guy goes, uh, what do you want? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? He goes, do you want this, this, this? And he's got a three or four ounces in front of them and, and pounds sitting around. So is he uh, talking about different strains? What do you want or weight exactly, or all of it? Exactly. Different strains. Uh, and it was my first real retail experience, I'd say, uh, where it was nice. There was a leather couch. There was a desk. It was a professional setup. There was sort of, uh, yeah, it, it was all clean and, and legit feeling. Um, at that time too, he told us about a seed company that was around the corner that we could go and get some seeds at. 
So uh, our thought was we'd be bringing out up there. And if we can get some stuff to flower off quick in Alaska, maybe we'll do a crop in Alaska. So I go and get the, uh, go to the seed company. I don't remember the name now. They gave me this big binder and I'm flipping through all these seeds. And I asked them, what's the fastest flowering, biggest bush you've got? Because I only got three or four months in Alaska. I end up buying a 12 mighty mite, they called them, a strain. Uh, but the only catch was the caveat was they couldn't give them to me right there. They had to ship them to me. So really? I, didn't, I didn't know my shipping address in Alaska yet. So I had them shipped to my little brother back in Maine. So I had them shipped them back there. And we get on our merry way and start driving up to Alaska. I get close to the border of Alaska, and now I know I got this ounce, ounce and a half on me, and I'm saying, fuck, now we're going to get back over the border into the U.S., and I'm going to smuggle drugs in there. What am I going to do? So You're not, uh, you're not yeah, I mean, it's not like you're doing pounds, but it's still um, not fun doing anything like that when you're crossing, um, you know, international borders like that. Exa- exactly. And we're the early days. I'm, I'm still 20, 21, 22, and... Uh, so I decide my mountain bike's on the roof of my car. I take the roof the mountain bike off. I take the tire off the mountain bike. I cut a hole in the tube of the mountain bike, and I can <laughs> all the weed inside the tube of the mountain bike. And then I patch that up. I have bleach sterilization. I have gloves on the whole thing, and I wash the whole tire down, put the tire back on the bike, pump it back up, and put it back on the roof of the car, thinking that it's inside the tube. I'm going to be fine. Um, okay, so point. you're so you're smuggling an ounce of cannabis. <laughs> In your mountain bike to go back across the border to yeah. to the U.S. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because okay. I'm going to uh, I'm going to Alaska for okay. the summer, and I was a, a volunteer park ranger for in Alaska, uh, <laughs> and I was afraid that I'd never find a uh, bud up there. So yeah. get, get over the border, we find our place in Seward, Alaska. I'm living in the back country; it's beautiful. I'm going to town once a week or so, in our ounce of weed and our one hitter pipe that broke on us that we had, a, we're rationing it off. So each person gets a, a hit or two a day. Um, halfway through the journey, July, uh, end of July or so, ended up meeting up with a local guy in the local Alaskans, unbeknownst to me, have claimed that they've got the best weed in the world. Uh, and some of them at the time had some really good product that they were, they were putting off. Um, so I ended up hooking up with that guy for a little bit and having a good time with him. Um, was he, teach, was he teaching anything or was he, were you guys no, just friends? Just, just friends, just, just a good local connection. That okay. day, but he, he was a grower there at the time. Okay. Uh, but I, I was only going to town every two weeks. So it was a real limited interaction I had with him. Um, but that's when a, the Alaskan Thunderfuck a, is the big thing they had. And they were all singing about way back. Gotcha. Um, so I speed up a little bit. Uh, summer's over. I come back home. A, get a job back around here doing uh, construction work, doing masonry work. Uh, my friends at the time are going to uh, UMass Amherst. Uh, and my older brother just graduated from UMass Amherst. Uh, my little brother, uh, my younger brother, when he was going out to see my older brother uh, in 95 to 98, when he was going to school at UMass, uh, there was a real early scene there with the, uh, the chem dog crew and those guys, the East coast sour diesel and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Um, now our close friends started going there after my brother grad, my older brother graduated. And so my little brother's still running out there and seeing uh, our close buddy. Um, he ended up getting hooked up with his roommate and his roommate was from Canada and his uh, Canadian roommate stopped by and said, Hey, uh, can you make this disappear? And uh, made a unit one pound disappear. And then next thing you know, uh, he can make two disappear and made that disappear real quick. And pretty quickly after that, uh, we have some associates that are running a, I think it was 49 pounds, 50 pounds every two weeks, every 10 days or so uh, to Canada or back in that where they were getting that for like 110,000. So they were getting it for like 22 a pound. It was awesome. Uh, wow. and, we, and at the time we can sell the, the Canadian beasters. We were getting a good price for it. Um, well, because I, the East coast prices are, they've always been, they've always brought a premium, especially from what I remember, uh, when you're sending stuff out from West coast to East coast, that always brought some yeah. pretty good numbers. So, so this cat used to go up to Niagara Falls a, in a rental car, a rental car would get loaded up, a, given back to him. And he'd stop at a half a dozen colleges. Uh, by the time he got back to us right on the East coast, right on the beach where I'm And by the time he got back to us, he only had 10 units left with him. And every stop that he made, he dropped off 10 or 20. Um, and then he'd turn around 10 days later and collect all the money and go back and keep doing that trip. Um, 
I was playing around a little bit, dabbling with them, but nothing serious like they were doing. They had uh, the glove compartments full of cash and in the bathtubs full of weed. And oh, yeah. I was a little too much and I, I couldn't get caught. Um, ended up buying my house in maybe 2004 at 24 or something like that, 23. Um, and that kind of got me a little bit more scared that I can't lose shit. Uh, and at about that same time, uh, and this was going, in this, you bought it in Massachusetts. Is that right? <laughs> exactly. In Massachusetts, okay. actually the house that I still live in right now. Okay. Uh, house that I grew up in all that good stuff. Cool. Um, we're walking down to the local pizza shop and me and my three friends are passing a, a local cop on the beat standing there. He's talking to a rookie cop and he speaks up enough that we can hear him. He says, Hey Joe, here comes the Canadian cartel. And we all just about shit ourselves. And we were like, whoa, what do you mean? No, no, that's not us. That's that guy. That's the, we never did anything. And like uh, how the hell do they even know you guys are, <laughs> are alive, right? They, exactly. And they knew way too much about us. So that scared everybody a little bit. That put everybody back down to their holes a little bit better. Um, and then uh, at that time, uh, my brother's up in Maine. He, he starts his grow up there. And uh, he just starts to produce fire, uh, the real top quality product. Um, 2009, he got his medical caregiver's license. Uh, I got married, uh, I've been married for 12 years now. So I got married a little bit before that. And uh, it was always a battle for me that I was doing brick masonry and, and trying to stay legit. I was hustling on the side, trying to make some extra cash there. And it really supplemented my life nicely. Um, with the wife and the kids and stuff, things started slowing down some more. A lot of people looked at me crazy in 2010, 2011 and said, why don't I move up north with my brother and grow plants with him? But at the time, Maine still only allowed their 36 plants. So you could make a living off it, but you couldn't make a great living off it. And it was still a real gray zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so it never really took the full plunge. It was growing in my house at the time. It had a little basement grow, had an outdoor grow a little bit. And we we're only talking two or 3,000 watt lights that had given me a couple of plants to buy sunglasses and stuff with. Mm -hmm. um, and now to get to where we are, 2016, the, the vote passed in Massachusetts. And uh, I said to my brother, we got uh, 20 years of experience in this. Uh, you so can this, grow is it, this is your brother, Chris, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, okay. Yeah. My younger brother, Chris, uh, is a phenomenal, phenomenal grower. Granted that everybody that you meet that grows weed is the best grower in the world. None of them, <laughs> none of them will tell you, I grow okay weed. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you tell those, uh, those owners out there that are looking for growers uh, that, uh, you know, I'm, I need a good grower. What do I look for? What do you tell those guys out there? What would you say to them? Um. That's, that's a real tough one. Uh, I would take somebody and I'd take somebody from the horticultural industry. Uh, take somebody from the plant, somebody that's working in a nursery already, because you can train the plant person uh, how to grow ganj uh, that already knows how to work in a commercial greenhouse. That's uh, a great tip. That's taking, a great tip taking a grower that has had minimal people contact. So it has very poor people skills. Generally, a lot of these growers are small gardens. They're stuck in the basement. They spent most of their life trying not to be found. Uh, so it, that breeds a person that isn't the, the greatest in communication, isn't the greatest in organization. It doesn't necessarily know how to follow the laws because they've been following their laws and their rules, not necessarily the rules of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, every grower, a, I've met 24-year-old growers that have told me they're the best. I've met 60-year-old growers that play music to their plants that tell me they're the best. Uh, the best ones that I've seen in the ones I get most uh, happy to talk about are uh, my, one of my friends has a, a doctorate in crop science. Uh, huh. And she went to school with uh, some of your friends um, over at Kind Love, I think it was. Okay. But uh, the, what they bring in their knowledge of plants and their knowledge of feeding is far greater than just dealing with one plant. Um, yeah, the, the, that's a, and this is a major one because, you know, I, I went through a lot of growing pains, literally and figuratively. And I think finding the person where you point out, finding somebody that, knows how to run on a commercial scale. And, you know, I'm, I'm big enough to say that I know I'm not the best grower. 
100%. There's some amazing people out there, but you know, there, there's so much talent out there. I think that people look at, well, they have had to grow cannabis before. And so that is not the case. Uh, like you said, you can teach them. Um, and this, looking at it that way can save so much time. I mean, because some of these growers will bring you, they'll, they'll some of them are good salesmen too, right? They're very yeah. good. They're very hyped about stuff. And so you'll spend six months or a year with them, paying them good money. And all of a sudden they just can't ever produce what they say. And you wasted 12 months and that's a yeah. lifetime when, in the plant world, right? And, and you have to know that you don't know some things. In, in, in the grow we have right now, uh, I'm extremely lucky for. Uh, and the reason I was able to get my business off the ground is because uh, I gave uh, started this company with a dream. Uh, we had nothing at all. I told my little brother if he became partners with me, uh, our plan would be to sell a third of the country company for financing. Uh, I was going to keep a third and then I was going to give him a third. And giving him the third, he had a spot uh, that's operational still that I could take investors to and say, this is what we're doing on 3,000 square feet. If you give me the money to do uh, 30,000 square feet, I can put the 10 factor to this build right here that you're looking at and that we're walking through. And this is the numbers that it's actually producing. And we can do it tenfold better. And Mm -hmm. I said, He's going to be the grower. He's going to keep doing everything he's doing. And I'll be the organizer guy and I'll build the whole facility. And uh, we found, uh, we found back in that way. So why didn't you and your brother just continually continue to stay in the black market gray area? It's uh, this is the greatest opportunity we've ever had. Uh, we've been outlaw misfits uh, for a good part of our lives. Uh, granted that both of us have never been arrested and we have very clean records and we try to be good citizens. Um, but when the dot com thing happened, I wasn't good at computers. I wasn't figuring that stuff out. Uh, this is a, a skill that we have ingrained into us uh, that we have a love for that. I think uh, it just it was an opportunity that knocked at the door. And it was an opportunity to tell the truth that I never thought I would be able to achieve. And most of the people that I've been telling that I'm doing this uh, or tell them my, my ideas that I want to do, tell me that I'm crazy. Uh, so what, as what are the, who are these people? Like you don't have to name them, but are they not, just in your social circle? Are they other growers or what? Every, everybody I talk to about this has an opinion a, a different way. Uh, and it's interesting from my close friends telling me that my uh, storm retention pond isn't big enough and it's going to fail because of that way. And, and this is a stormwater pond to catch the water off my driveway and, and people are hating on that. Um, so it's just to put all that stuff behind you and just keep plugging forward. Uh, we had a, this is our third or fourth location uh, that we're on and we're building out. Uh, the first three got shut down from uh, various different reasons. Um, when we found this property. You mean since 2016, this is the fourth? Exactly. Okay. So 2016, I got a lease on a 150 acre dairy farm. That's directly across the street from the building I'm in now. Uh, That property is in what's called agricultural protection restrictions. So you can't grow federally illegal crops on it. Um, That was kind of a tough lesson to learn then, huh? Exactly. And I got my community host agreement after a, after a year of chasing down my mayor, I got my community host agreement. He signed my permission slip to grow on this piece of property. And then two weeks later, I found out when I was going through the rest of the process that uh, that property wasn't allowed to be grown on. So what, now did, I had, what did you do when you found that out? Uh, it was it was pretty devastating that I had a permission yeah. slip to legally grow weed in my town on a piece of property that you weren't allowed to do it on. And it was a huge blunder, a huge mistake by my point. I, I spent six how, months trying to get this place licensed that was just unrealistic. It couldn't how happen. much money did you lose? Um, had a pretty good handshake deal with, with my tenant. Um, I noticed that a lot of people that enjoy cannabis will help you out in this process uh, if one hand can wash the other. Um, so, so we got a really good lease on, on, on just keeping the farmer happy. Um, so, gotcha. so it wasn't, wasn't a lot of money out of pocket. Uh, so let's go to the second location then. So, yeah. so you, you've, you've picked up your, you've cried in your beer and you're like, okay, now I got to move forward. Like what drives you to move to the next one? 
a, I had the little wind of that behind me that I had this community host agreement. So I knew that I was restricted to my town, Amesbury. So I pulled out the zoning map and started saying, what are the available locations? And literally it made a list on a notepad and drove around town to, and knocked on every available door and, and tried to figure that out. Found an old chair making factory. Uh, that looked beautiful, completely empty, 100,000 square feet. I was in love when I saw it. Walked through, the guy wanted to do $4.50 a square foot. So it, it was cheap too. Yeah. Uh, and he was willing to rent me 20,000, 40,000, 60,000 and keep going up from there. And, he, and you, out, told him, you told him you were going to be growing in it right away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a great guy. He was real happy as can be, but he said, I own this in a family trust. I have to go talk with my sister and my father. Uh, his sister's husband is an insurance risk management person uh, and said growing cannabis in the building is crazy. Uh, the, the father was 70 or is 60, no, sorry, no, 96 or 97 years old oh, wow. uh, and said, there's no way this cannabis is being grown in my facility. So <laughs> he was just, but, you know, demon, that demon weed is what he was. Yeah, yeah no, I, exactly. I, so, so that got shot down. And now I have a, I have no financial backing. A, I have this host agreement. My lawyer who working with me a, is a local public defender. Uh, I ended up giving him 1% of my company because I could not afford him at all. A, and he likes our industry also. So we worked together a little bit in, in his garden. And he helped me out a little bit and a, I was able to afford him that way. Um, so now I'm with my lawyer. We have two locations that fail. We go and tour another one that these people really, really want us on. They're happy on it. A, but it's a, you know, one percent. That's it's, awesome. I <laughs> I would you know congratulations. I um, you know for for the listeners and the viewers out there, um, I I want to. There's several other episodes where I discuss how to get somebody behind you in your corner. And what Matt has done here is he has taken a bad situation where he had no money, and he was able to you know, find somebody that has the legal knowledge to help him out, but also get somebody with a driving force to want him to succeed. This is a big part of it because when you're growing that business and you have multiple people pushing, not just looking for a paycheck, it helps towing that line a lot easier, right? Exactly. And, and uh, unbeknownst to him, though, uh, the lawyer, I looped him into me pretty good, where now I had a respected member of the community. Uh, he's on a couple of different boards in town. He he's, uh, volunteers throughout town and is very well respected uh, in the community and the state. Uh, suddenly I can say, well, uh, this guy is on our team, too. He, yeah. How does that make you look to the to the rest of the community. Exactly. It, it gives me some professionality that, that I got this one guy, if everybody respects him uh, and he's willing to talk with me, then uh, I must be somebody. That's awesome. Uh, so, and I told him the plan was that uh, we had a backer, we have a backer. And at this whole time I had a dozen different people that I was trying to toy with and trying to get money off of. Um, and it was nerve wracking. You don't know which person to take. Which, uh, we don't know what things are going to cost. At the time, I was asking for like 1.6 million. I uh, found a local builder that I was doing a ton of work with, a real nice guy to me at the time. I uh, said, I'll give you that money, no problem. Uh, started seeing some things in him when he talked about the, uh, I've got the purchase and sales agreement on this property uh, with uh, 10,000 down. And I locked it up for 90 days until I had to buy the property. So I put 10,000 down that I borrowed off my brother, it locked this property up. And now we had 90 days to find a financer to really uh, buy this property for us. This guy was saying, we can find a bank that can buy it for us. We can do this. We can do that. This person will give us the money. And I said, well, the reason I'm coming to you is because I thought you were going to fund me outright. And he goes, yeah, I can fund you outright, but it's better if we don't do this with our own money. We should do it with somebody else's money. And I said, well, that's exactly what I'm trying to do with you. And you shouldn't be trying to do this outside of me. So, um, <laughs> How much and time did you waste on him? It, that was a six months court, courtship. So and now, I, so now yeah. you've got, there's a year gone by now with yeah. going through. Okay. It, and the whole time he was saying, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. But it never helped me find property or anything. And then I got this pro property locked down in my name. And that really said that nobody else can get this except for me. And except for who I decide to bring on the team. Um, at a similar time, my mom's a real estate agent. Uh, her coworker, uh, her and her husband, uh, 
got into a fortunate situation and they sold the company. Uh, she's a real estate agent. He's a, a commercial fisherman and they had some interest in another company that they sold. Uh, so they came across a little bit of money. Uh, she reached out to my mom in the office one day and said, Hey, we're getting some cash. We're thinking about this marijuana thing. Do you know anything? Uh, do you know any property that might be available? And she said, well, actually, uh, both my sons are heavily invested in this. And one of them has a, a purchase and sales agreement on a property right now. So your, your family knew everything that you guys were doing? It, it, oh, very much so. Very okay. much so. Uh, in, in, uh, my little brother in ninth grade, I watched my mother uh, flush down a quarter pound of weed down the toilet. <laughs> and my, my uncle the next weekend was saying, Linda, what the hell are you going to do? The kid's going to get his legs busted. <laughs> 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 the old school ways for yeah. sure. So, uh, so yeah, met up, met up with our business partners. Uh, told them that uh, our lawyers got 1%. I said, I want to give my brother 30%. I want to control the majority share of the company. So maybe I'll get 30%, uh, 35%. I think we sold to 32% of the company off or something like that. But um, this was like, this was somebody that you weren't even really connected to because you said you had like 12 people that you were trying to work with right it, it, exactly there was a lot of other people that i was courting that that i, I was, thought i was going to do business with and, and this was never a consideration to tell you the truth the, i considered his brother at one time because I, I knew his brother had some money uh, so i was thinking about that but uh, never thought that my business partners would be who my business partners are so that's a, that's a really good point too. You, you started somewhere and you're like, I can't believe this actually happened this way. Um, so know. I, so I sit down with them uh, we're at a bar. I give them a little jar. Uh, we talk about the plan and they said, we want to go see up North. We're going to consider this. Uh, ended up the, the guy that I was courting for the six months prior. Uh, he took off and went to Hawaii for a month. Uh, and that gave me enough time in the month of January to kind of finalize my business partner. Uh, finalized with this other guy. Uh, when the original guy came back, uh, he looked at me and said, oh my God, man, I can't believe you're making this decision. This guy has way too much money. All he's going to do is steal your company from you. Uh, you don't know him. Uh, we know each other. We're going to work through this together. And I said, ah, I'm not really sure. He calls me back and said, no, what, Matt, for the last two years, you've been working for this company, right? Jamaco? I said, yeah. And he goes, have you taken a paycheck? I said, no. And I, I spent all my money. And he goes, well, I think the job you've done in the last two years is at least 100000 a year. And he said, so I'll cut you a check right now for 200000 cash, eh, free and clear, eh, to become your business partner. And then I'll fund your whole operation. Wow. He, so he was really trying to get in there. So what? how so, did that make you feel when you said that? Um having $10,000, having $8,000 in your bank account and having your monthly expenses be $5,000 uh, and having somebody offer you $200,000, um, it was a tough decision. You've just listened to another insightful episode of Plant Problems. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues. For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblem.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frischconnect. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey.